Well, good morning. We want to welcome those who are watching on TV or online this morning. And this morning, we are in between sermon series. So we just finished the uh, series on the book of Titus. And Lord willing, in just a few weeks, we're going to begin the series on Revelation. But in between those two series, we're preaching some different sermons. And when I get an opportunity like this in between sermon series, what I usually do is I just preach on whichever passage I'm most personally excited about at that moment. Whichever passage is feeding my soul the most. And so that's exactly what I'm going to be doing this morning. I'm going to be preaching on a passage that has really been challenging me this year. And my prayer is that it will be an encouragement to you this morning. Today we're going to look at a prophecy about Jesus the Messiah found in Isaiah chapter 50. This prophecy is one of the four servant songs. Now what are the servant songs? The servant songs are four prophecies found in Isaiah. There's one in Isaiah 42. There's one in Isaiah 49. There's one that we're going to be looking at today in Isaiah chapter 50. And there's one, the most famous one, in Isaiah chapter 53. These servant songs are called songs because they're written in poetry, like pretty much all prophecies are. They're called servant songs because each one of these prophecies describes Jesus using the messianic title of God's servant. So let's get down to business and let's see what we can learn from this ancient prophecy. The first thing we're going to learn today is that Jesus was sent to help hurting people. Look with me at Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. Jesus says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. This passage says that Jesus was sent into this broken world to teach comforting words to those who are weary. Have you ever thought of it that way? That Jesus is the all-time champion when it comes to comforting people. Jesus' words have comforted more people than anyone else who has ever lived. To those who are worn out, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are laden and all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. To those who are having trouble in the world, Jesus says, You will have troubles in this world, but take heart, I have overcome the world. To those who are facing death, Jesus said, Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. To those facing the loss of a loved one, Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. To those who felt like they were being abandoned, Jesus said, My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. To the woman who was caught in adultery, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. One of the other servant songs describes how gentle Jesus would be with hurting people. Look with me at Isaiah 42 in verse 3. This verse is describing what Jesus would be like. And in verse 3, it says that a bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. This prophecy says that Jesus would not break a bruised reed nor extinguish a smoking flax. What in the world does that mean? Well, what, what's a bruised reed? I believe I have a picture up here on the screen. There it is. So that's a bruised reed. So let me ask you, have you ever felt like that before? Have you ever felt beat up or about to snap? What's a, what's a smoking flax? Well, I've got a picture of a smoking flax here up on the screen. That's a smoking flax, a candle that's just about to go out. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt like your light is about to go out? Now, we have similar sayings within our culture. We might say something like someone is at the end of their rope or that they're about to break or that they're running on fumes. And the point of these two word pictures is that Jesus is gentle to those who are bruised and to those who are in danger of their light flickering out. And you know what? That's good news this morning if you feel like a bruised reed or a smoking flax. Has life been beating you down? Do you feel weighed down? Do you feel like you're about to crack? 
Well, there's good news. The good news is that this prophecy says that Jesus came to help people just like you. He wants to help you. He wants to save you. He wants to lift you up. Are you hurting? Do you feel helpless, hopeless, heartbroken? Do you feel weak like you can't go on? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Then there's good news. Jesus came for people just like you. Do you feel like a misfit? Jesus came to fit you into his family. Do you feel forgotten? Jesus never forgets. Do you feel like an outcast? Jesus will never cast you out if you will just come to him. You see, Jesus is filling up his kingdom with people just like you. Jesus came to hurt, to, Jesus came to help hurting people just like you. The second thing we're going to see in the prophecy this morning is that Jesus was attacked by the people he came to help. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 50, but this time let's look at verse 5 and 6. Jesus says, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. There's a surprising twist in this part of the prophecy. The twist is that even though Jesus came to help people, a lot of people ended up hating him for it. And Jesus was attacked by the very same people he came to help. But no matter how much resistance Jesus faced, no matter how much opposition he faced, Jesus was determined to be obedient to the will of his heavenly Father. I think that's what Jesus meant in this passage when he said, I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me. You see, Jesus didn't let opposition keep him from finishing his mission. He was going to stick to the plan no matter what. Now, this part of the prophecy specifically points out that Jesus' enemies would hit him, that they would spit on him, and that they would try to shame him. And of course, all three of these details came exactly and literally true 700 years later at the end of Jesus' life. For example, look with me at Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, verse 65. This verse is describing a little bit of what happened to Jesus after he was arrested. And in verse 65, it says, Then some began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to beat him and say, Prophesy. And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. The very people Jesus was trying to help turned against him. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever tried to help someone and it ended up that they turned against you for it? Now, as a pastor, I have had that happen to me, uh, let's just say more than once, okay? And if you've ever had that happen to you, if you've ever tried to help someone and they turned against you for it, then you can take heart because Jesus knows how you feel. If you've ever been attacked by the people you're trying to help, then remember that Jesus has been there before you were there. Jesus knows what it's like to be attacked by the very people he was trying to help. The third thing we're going to see in this prophecy, and this is the one that I want to spend the most time on, is that Jesus was determined to complete his mission no matter what. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 50, this time in verse 7. Jesus says, For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. The prophets are full of imagery. And this verse contains a very rich image, a, a very full metaphor. In this verse, Jesus says that despite all the opposition, that he had set his face like a flint. What does that image mean? What does it mean to set your face like a flint? Well, remember that flint is a hard rock. And when it breaks, it often leaves behind sharp angular edges. This is why flint is often used to make arrowheads or to even make knife blades. In fact, I think I have a picture of some flint arrowheads and some flint knife blades. So I think part of the picture here is that Jesus metaphorically had a determined look on his face. He had a sharp look of determination that was as hard as stone. Now, I'm not much of an actor, so I don't know if I'm a good enough actor to try to act out what it looks like to have a face set as a flint, but I've seen actors in movies set their faces like a flint. For example, if you're a Braveheart fan, William Wallace set his face like a flint when he yelled out freedom and rushed the enemy. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, like I am, Aragorn 
set his face like a flint when he rushed out of Helm's Deep to attack the orcs head on. If you're an Avengers fan, Captain America set his face like a flint when he picked up Thor's hammer and charged and attacked Thanos. I think the other part of this word picture is that when you attach a flint to an arrow or to a knife, you have to fasten it tight enough so that it doesn't come loose. The flint has to be securely set in place. It has to be stuck, right? And so I think part of the point of this image is that Jesus had made up his mind. His mind was set. He would not wiggle. He would not come loose. He was committed to carrying out the mission that his heavenly father had given him, and nothing and no one was ever going to stop him. He would never quit. He would never stop. He would never give in, no matter what he had to go through. Jesus was described this very same way in Luke chapter 9. Look with me at Luke chapter 9, verse 51. This passage is uh, describing Jesus as he's heading towards the end of his life. And in Luke chapter 9, it says, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that's kind of another way of saying the time had come for him to die, that he what? Steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Does that language sound familiar? That set his face language is very similar to the language we find in Isaiah 50, in which Jesus himself said that he was going to set his face. Now, how could Jesus stay so committed? How was he able to press on and complete his mission? What secret helped him to never give up? The secret to Jesus' perseverance was that he knew that God was with him. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 50, starting in verse 8. Jesus says, He is near who justifies me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. Surely the Lord God will help me. Who is he who will condemn me? Indeed, they will all grow old like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Now, I don't know if it's just the, the wrestler in me, uh, but I love this passage. Jesus was basically saying to his enemies, you want to come at me? Bring it on. Let's do this. Let's go toe to toe. Because it doesn't matter who's against me if God is for me. It doesn't matter who's on the other team if God is on my team. And did you know that us believers are supposed to have this same perspective? In fact, look with me at Romans chapter 8. As we read through this passage, notice how similar the language of this passage is to Isaiah 50. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the Apostle Paul had Isaiah 50 in mind when he penned this passage. But look with me at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Paul asks a series of questions. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This passage reminds us that it doesn't matter who is against us if God is for us. Jesus was able to stay so committed, not only because he knew that God was with him, but also because he knew the end of the story. Jesus trusted that the time would come when his enemies would be dealt with. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 11. Jesus says, Look, all you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourself with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks you have kindled. This you shall have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Jesus knew that in his first coming, Jesus would be tormented by his enemies. But Jesus also knew 
that in his second coming, the roles would be reversed, that the tables would be turned, and that those who were kindling a fire against him would eventually be the ones who ended up getting burned. Now, this servant song that we've looked at this morning was written 2,700 years ago about Jesus. But what is the application for us today? Today, I want to share two points of application. The first point of application is this, that this prophecy should make us thankful that Jesus stuck to it. This morning, I hope we've gained at least one more reason to appreciate Jesus. I hope we've gained at least one more reason to worship him. And the reason is this, that Jesus never quits. Have you ever thought about Jesus that way? He's a never quitter, right? Every other person who's ever lived has quit probably a trillion times in their life. But Jesus is the only person who ever lived who never quit. What if our salvation depended on how flinty-faced we are? What if our salvation required us to be flinty-faced for just 33 years? Could we go 33 years without sinning? No, of course not. What if our salvation depended on us just being flinty-faced for 33 seconds? Could we pull that off? I'm not sure. You see, if salvation depended on our ability to stick to it, then we would all be in big trouble. But praise God that Jesus was flinty-faced for us. Jesus was flinty-faced flinty -faced in our place. He was flinty-faced on our behalf. You see, Jesus was perfectly obedient for 33 years. He never failed. He never sinned, not even once. Jesus did for us what we could never do for ourselves. He accomplished what we could never pull off. And in doing so, that should make us eternally, deeply grateful. That's the main point of this passage. That's the main application, because this passage is about Jesus. But I do think there is a second application, because I think this passage should also motivate us to take a look at ourselves. And so I think this prophecy should make us evaluate how determined we are in the Christian life. All this year, this passage has been challenging me to ask myself, have I set my face like a flint? How flinty-faced am I? How determined am I? The Bible has a lot to say about perseverance in the Christian life, a lot to say about endurance, a lot to say about pressing on and not giving up. In fact, look with me at what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 13. Paul said, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Like Paul, we too need to keep pressing forward in the Christian life. Like Jesus, we too need to set our faces like a flint. Because Jesus isn't the only one who's been given a mission. We've been given a mission. What is our mission? To be disciples and to make disciples. To follow Jesus ourselves and to help other people to do the same. So I think this is a good question for all of us to ask ourselves this morning. Have we set our faces like a flint to accomplish the mission that God has given us? How flinty is our faith? Have we decided that with God's help, we will not let anything to stop us from carrying out his mission. What will it take to make us quit? Sometimes it's easy for us Christians to be jello-faced instead of flinty-faced. Sometimes instead of being solid and steady, we're often wobbly. We're shaky. We're as soft and jiggly as jello in the Christian life. Sometimes us Christians give up at the first sign of trouble. Maybe this morning you're in danger of giving up on something that God has called you to. Perhaps you're in a difficult marriage. It doesn't seem like it's getting any better, and you're not sure how much longer you can take it. Maybe you are in danger of giving up when it comes to getting along with your in-laws. Now, I am very blessed that I have the best in-laws on planet Earth, but I know that not everybody is in that same situation. Maybe you're in danger of giving up when it comes to parenting. Perhaps at the beginning of COVID, you started homeschooling, and there are days where you are thinking about quitting, right? Maybe you have a special needs child, and you love them so much, but some days you just don't know if you have the strength. 
Maybe you're a grandparent raising your grandkids. Parenting is difficult enough when you're in your 20s and your 30s. It's extremely difficult when you're not. Maybe you're the one taking care of your parents as they grow older. That's part of what it means to honor thy father and mother. But it's not always easy, is it? Maybe you're a caretaker for your spouse whose health is failing. Perhaps they have some terrible disease like Alzheimer's or, or dementia. Maybe it's your own health that's failing. You're facing endless doctor's appointments, endless tests, mountains of medicine every day. Maybe there's some sin or addiction that you're struggling with and you're not sure if you can stay clean. Maybe you've committed to volunteer here at the church, but you've faced some hard times. Perhaps there's been a lot of people in your life group who've moved away to Idaho or Texas or one of those places. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher and you have a kid who is, um, let's say, who needs extra love and you are at your wit's end. Maybe you have loved ones who are lost and you've been praying for their salvation for years, but you're starting to lose hope that they might ever get saved. Perhaps you've tried to read your Bible, but you keep stopping. Maybe you've wanted to become more regular in your church attendance, but it just seems like every week something pops up that's a reason not to come. Maybe you're facing opposition for your faith at work or maybe even at school. Perhaps you've been getting made fun of, maybe getting bullied, maybe even getting beat up for your faith. Maybe you're stuck in a miserable job and you know that your family needs you just to, to stay put, but your patience is running out. Maybe you committed to giving to something, but then COVID hit and your finances changed. Whatever it is, in the Christian life, there are times where we have to draw a line in the sand. There are times in the Christian life where we have to set our face like a flint and decide that by God's grace, we are not going to quit, that we're not going to give up no matter what. I think all of us admire people like that, people who refuse to quit, people who refuse to back up and refuse to back down. That's why we like movies like Rudy, right? Rudy, that boy, he just refused to quit. He just never gave up, and we love him for it. Abraham Lincoln was another person who knew how to set his face like a flint. It took 28 long years for Abraham Lincoln to become the president, and he faced many failures along the way. In 1832, Abraham Lincoln lost his job. Then he lost in a race for state legislature. In 1833, he failed in business. In 1835, his sweetheart died. In 1836, he had a nervous breakdown. In 1838, he ran for Speaker of the House and lost. In 1843, he ran for Congress and lost. In 1849, he was rejected for land officer. In 1854, he ran for U.S. Senate and guess what? Lost. In 1856, he ran for Vice President and lost. In 1858, he ran for U.S. Senate again and lost again. Then, in 1860, he was elected the President of the United States. How did Abraham Lincoln do it? Because he flat out refused to quit. He was determined. Walt Disney was another man who knew how to set his face like a flint. As a young man, Walt Disney was fired from his newspaper job. And you know why he was fired? His boss said he had a lack of good ideas. Can you imagine that? Walt Disney having a lack of good ideas. So in 1921, he started his own animation company that quickly went bankrupt. So then he took on a second business that quickly went bankrupt. His finances got so bad that he ended up eating dog food in order to survive. Let me ask you, have you ever been that down and out, so down and out that you had to eat dog food to stay alive? But Walt refused to give up. He kept going, and he kept going, and finally he succeeded. Today, the Disney Corporation is worth 200 billion, with a B, dollars. How did that happen? Because Walt Disney refused to quit. Sylvester Stallone is another person who knew how to set his face like a flint. Sylvester was born to immigrants, and he grew up in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of Manhattan. Now, as you can probably guess by the name of the neighborhood, Hell's Kitchen is not an easy place to grow up. When Sylvester's mom was delivering him, there were labor complications. And in a desperate attempt to save their lives, the doctors accidentally nicked a nerve which paralyzed half of Sylvester's face. That gave him his signature snarl and his signature slurred speech. 
Growing up as a kid, he was constantly bullied and made fun of for how he looked and for how he talked. When Sylvester was a young man, he had a hard time making it as an actor. In fact, things got so bad that he had to sell his beloved dog, Butkus. I think I have a picture of Butkus. There he is, up on the screen. So he was walking, Sylvester was walking past the 7-Eleven with his dog, and he met a guy outside of the 7-Eleven, and he sold his dog for 50 bucks to the guy outside of the 7-Eleven. Let me ask you, have you ever been that down and out, so down and out that you had to sell your dog to survive? Well, eventually, Sylvester was able to sell his Rocky script that he had written, and he finally had some money in his pocket. So he went back to that guy who he had sold the dog to, and he tried to buy his dog back. And the guy agreed to sell the dog back, but he hiked up the price to $3,000. So there you go. Uh, fun fact, both the dog and the guy he sold it to made it into the first Rocky movie. Now, the Rocky fran franchise is worth $1.7 billion. How did Sylvester do it? He refused to quit. Colonel Sanders was another man who knew how to set his face like a flint. You know, Colonel Sanders, the guy on the side of the KFC boxes, right? Colonel Sanders had failed at pretty much everything he had ever tried to do in his entire life. But then at 65 years old, he set out with a dream. He set out on a mission to sell chicken. And so when he set out, all he had to his name was his recipe and a $105 social security check. And so he started trying to sell his recipe to restaurants. And 1,009 restaurants turned him down until finally one restaurant bought his recipe. Today, KFC is the fourth largest restaurant chain on planet Earth. How did that happen? Because Colonel Sanders was committed. Dr. Seuss was another person who knew how to set his face like a flint. Dr. Seuss flunked out of Oxford and uh, dropped out of school. After he wrote his first book, he tried to sell his manuscript to publishing companies, and 28 different publishing companies turned him down. By the end of Dr. Seuss's life, he had sold 600 million copies of his books in 20 different languages. How did he pull this off? Because he refused to quit. What's my point? My point in all this is this, that if all of these people were that flinty faced with these lesser goals, how much more flinty should our faces be when it comes to the greatest goal of all, to living out the Christian life? And the good news in all of this is that we don't have to do this on our own. We don't have to persevere under our own strength. Look with me in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We can persevere because God will persevere. We can press on because God will press on. There are times when we're going to feel like quitting on him, but we can have the confidence that God will never quit on us. I wouldn't want anybody to misunderstand me this morning. In this sermon, I am not saying that it's all up to us to just suck it up and tough it out in the Christian life. The reason we even have the strength to set our faces like a flint is because the God of infinite strength lives inside of us. Because the God who never quits, we just sung about that, is with us. Like Jesus said, for the Lord God will help me. Let's look at one last verse this morning. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 10. Jesus says, Who among you fears the Lord? And who obeys the voice of his servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. Jesus says when you're facing times of darkness, when you are tempted to quit, that we need to trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon our God. That phrase, to trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon our God, is to me one of the clearest descriptions of faith in the entire Bible. That's what faith means. And did you know that there is one thing that setting your face like a flint can never get you? And that's salvation. You see, getting saved is not about trying harder or, or being better. It's not about what we can do. It's about trusting in what Jesus has already done for us. The only reason that we can be saved is because Jesus set his face like a flint. The only reason we can be saved is because Jesus never quit. Because Jesus accomplished his mission. 
You see, the Bible says that we've all sinned. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how many goods we, good deeds we do, our good deeds can never make up for the bad things we've already done. Something has to be done about our sin. And the good news is that Jesus did something about our sin. He came into this broken world. He lived a perfect, sinless life in our place. And then he died on the cross to take the punishment we deserve. He took our place. And three days later, he came back from the dead, defeating death and sin forever. And what that means is that the dividing line between who goes to heaven and who does not is not who is good versus who is bad. That's what most people think. Let me show you a little chart here on the screen. Most people think that good people go to heaven, bad people don't. The problem with that way of thinking is that all of us are on the bottom part of that chart. All of us are on the wrong side of the line because we've all sinned. None of us have been good enough. And so that is incorrect. The correct way of thinking about it is this next chart, that people who believe in Jesus are saved, those who don't are not. And so the final question this morning is this. Which side of that line are you on? Have you believed in Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him? If you've never made that decision, then I want to beg you, don't let another minute go by before you make the best decision you'll ever make to give your life to Jesus. In just a moment, we're going to have what we call a time of invitation. We're going to stand and we're going to sing, and there's going to be pastors and other people here at the front who would love to help you with whatever God is doing in your heart. Maybe this morning, you've been thinking about giving your life to Jesus for a while, and today you say, you know what? Today's the day. I'm going to do it today. Or maybe you walked in here having no expectation of making any sort of spiritual decision this morning, but God's been doing something in your heart, and you're ready to run to him. Don't wait. As soon as we start singing, come forward, talk to someone about it. Maybe you've already believed in Jesus, but you've never been obedient to be baptized as a public announcement of your faith. If that's you, please come forward. We'd love to talk to you about getting baptized. Maybe you've been trying out churches and you've been trying out this church and you've come to the point where you say, you know what? I want to officially make this my spiritual home and my faith family. If that's you, come forward, talk to someone about it. Perhaps this morning, you just need prayer for something. Something going on in your life or in the life of someone you care about. Maybe it's possible that, that you've been sort of jello-faced recently and you want to come and rededicate your life and ask God to give you the strength to be flinty-faced. Maybe there's something going on in your life I don't even know about or something in, in the life of someone you care about. Whatever it is, as soon as we start singing, come forward so we can pray with you. Whatever is going on in your heart, don't resist God any longer. Give in to him today.